I heard they were forming the Dawn Guard. Vampire hunters or something in the old fort near Riften. Might consider joining up myself. Skyrim's main quest was a sweeping story about power and responsibility. It put the Dragonborn up against Draugr and dragons, saw them win or arrest a civil war. And the story that started in a Helgenbound carriage ended with a climactic battle in Sovngarde, with a dragon that's destined to eat the world. So after all that, what would Skyrim do next? Vampires, apparently. This time, it's not a dragon that's out to destroy the world, it's a vampiric warlord. Instead of one Elder Scroll being wrapped up in the plot, we have three. Crossbows, horse combat, perk trees, oh my. Dogguard's additions to Skyrim's world are minimal, but the story it delivers is surprisingly ambitious and, at times, surpasses the quality of the base games. Dawnguard focuses on its character and character moments more than the main quest of Skyrim ever did, and nowhere is that more important than Serana. She's the heart of the story and probably the most well-developed character in the entire game. But, like Skyrim's main quest, Dawnguard has the structure and pieces to do something really interesting. But the story we're ultimately left with is one of missed potential. Dawnguard wants to be about family, obsession, and obligation. But Bethesda's disinterest in their own characters keeps its vital narrative moments from landing with any weight. So while it's not reinventing Bethesda's narrative wheel, Dawnguard surprised me by doing a lot of the little things right. So let's jump right into it and make for Fort Dawnguard. Someone can and probably has written an essay on how to thoughtfully integrate the start of DLC content into a base game's main world. It's probably quite tricky to do right. Unless you're from software for some reason, you probably want to make it clear to players how they can access the new content that they paid for, so that they can jump in when they're ready. But you also don't want to make it feel overly highlighted at the expense of immersion. Back in 2012, Skyrim chose violence. Once the DLC was installed and the player hit the level required to start the Dawnguard quest, vampires would start raiding towns and villages at a strangely high frequency, to the point where Skyrim eventually tuned these raids way down to keep them from killing a ton of non-essential NPCs. On release, you were motivated to join the Dawnguard just to keep your favorite blacksmith alive. It was annoying and chaotic, but it was effective in motivating our actions. With that tuned down, things are much more laid back. You'll either hear about the Dawnguard from a guard's comment, or you'll be approached by a member directly to be recruited. Straightforwardness at the expense of pretty much everything else, as the lack of any personal stakes makes joining the Dawnguard feel like something the Dragonborn does out of boredom or curiosity, rather than genuine narrative motivation. Without the widespread attacks, there's no inciting incident for this phase. We just sort of decide to go there because that's where we know the story is. When the plot escalates from a typical faction quest to a prophecy-shrouded artifact hunt, it doesn't feel like we're swept away by an engaging chain of cause and effect. Rather, we're gently floating down Bethesda story stream. It's odd because there is a functional inciting incident that's referenced, the destruction of the Hall of the Vigilance of Stendar. We'll pass it on our first quest. We'll be able to walk through the smoldering hall, investigate the burned and broken bodies. But that's only after we've already decided to start the Dawnguard experience, after we've found the cave in Riften and joined up with the Dawnguard for whatever motivation we assign ourselves. And yes, once we begin the quest line, the discovery of Serana and her scrolls is what really kicks things off, but only structurally. In a practical story sense, things begin because we choose to start them. I'm not sure why the attack on the hall isn't where the quest begins, why we aren't drawn there via quest or invitation. Watching a vampire lord or powerful vampires tear their way through the vigilance and reduce their hall to ruin could have been this DLC's Helgen moment, starting things with a bang. Then again, it wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly why Bethesda shied away from that approach. This game already had a Helgen event, so instead we get a little piece of kvatch, witnessing the fallout rather than being in the epicenter. So, having heard of the growing vampire menace, or let's be honest, probably out of boredom, the last dragonborn makes for the mountain range east of Riften to find Fort Dawnguard in Dayspring Canyon. At the trailhead, we meet a blonde-haired farm boy, armed with his paw's axe. He's heard of the vampire menace and he's here to do his part. I love this kind of character, more virtue than talent, and a kind of innocence and naivete that will endear him to the player. He's essentially who we were at the start of our journeys, little to his name but a call to adventure. This combination of innocence and duty makes him so full of narrative potential, but after this introduction, Dongard forgets him completely. He won't sacrifice himself for anything, we won't be there to see his frightened jubilation at slaying his first vampire. 
Should you join with Harkon, there will never be a tragic moment where he stands between you and your objective, forcing you to kill someone who you know is fundamentally good to achieve your dark mission. His name is Ogmir, and once you leave Castle Dongard to find Serana, the story essentially forgets him. When he gets closer to the castle, he starts to get a little confused. Where is everybody? This place looks almost deserted. The castle does seem abandoned, and at the door to the entrance hall, the guard seems surprised when he learns that the two of you are new recruits. Inside the hall, the cobwebs are just as prominent as the moth-eaten banners that hang from the dirty stone walls. Isron, the leader of the fledgling Dawn Guard, is speaking with one of the surviving members of the Vigilance of Stendar. Isron, Karset is dead. The Hall of the Vigilance, everyone, they're all dead. You were right, we were wrong. Isn't that enough for you? Yes, well, I never wanted any of this to happen. I tried to warn all of you. I am sorry, you know. So who are you? What do you want? Isron recognizes that the Dragonborn can probably handle Very themselves right. and sends I them out into the field to start taking the fight to the vampires, starting with a trip to Dim Hollow Crypt. The, the surviving I'm Vigilant sure pledges to meet us there, despite the Isron advising him against it. In my critique of the base game story, I noted a lot of Skyrim's shallowness and lazy characterization. To my surprise, Dongard is a step up in this regard. We actually get a lot of nice character moments and details until, weirdly, the end of the game when I think they're needed most. But I wanted to take a second to highlight an exchange that I think is really well done. What's your name? Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Agmir, sir. Do I look like a sir to you, boy? I'm not a soldier, and you're not joining the army. Yes, sir. E Isran. Didn't I tell you to step forward? Hm. Farm boy, huh? What's your weapon? My weapon? I mostly just use my paw's axe. When wolves are attacking the goats or something. My paw's axe. <laughs> Stand up, preserve us. Don't worry. I think we can make a dawn god out of you. It's just nice characterization for Isron that there's a warmth to this man when others need there to be. Something in him recognizes that the Dragonborn doesn't need this kind of treatment, that they can be handed orders and sent on their way. And now he sees Agmir standing nervously, and you can hear the tone in his voice shift to something a little gentler, a little more paternal. We'll later learn that Isron's obsession with the vampires and his hardline approach has pushed almost everyone he's worked with away. So this moment of gentleness is demonstrative of a growth we don't even know to be looking for yet. Isran also dispenses with the formalities immediately, in stark contrast to the way Lord Harkin and his court operates. Do I look like a sir to you, boy? I am Harkin, lord of this court. Lord Harkin, remember your place. Again, you could miss this moment if you just turn around and walk out after getting your quest. But if you want to learn more about these characters and you stay to listen, Bethesda actually rewards the player with a well-written conversation. Gold star! For now, we're off, leaving the autumnal golds of Dayspring Canyon and making our way for the snowy mountains east of Morthal. The land of Skyrim is as wondrous as ever, even up here in the Hjalmarge. The wintry forest of snow-covered pines surrounds the fading road. The trees rigid despite the gusting of a western wind. The snow crunches and rhythmic taps underfoot. On my way up to the crypt, I ran into a trio of revelers, enjoying the rare spot of winter sun. Hey, friend. It's good to see another merry soul enjoying this fine day. However critical I am of Skyrim's storytelling or its characters, Skyrim is just so damn easy to love because of this world and the moments like this. It may sound a little hokey, but there really is a magic to this land. There's something so endearing and comforting about it, and I love that its characters get to love it as much as we do. This game is almost always underwhelming from a story perspective, but my goodness is it still a tremendous, delightful joy to behold and to get lost in. To get to Dim Hollow Crypt, we pass by the ruined Hall of the Vigilant. The dark irony is obvious, the blood even more so, and our stakes are made clear. Isron's right, the vampires are back, and they're a serious threat. As we enter the crypt, we overhear a conversation between a pair of vampires. The Vigilant who was going to meet us here to avenge his fallen comrades has been slain. Once you clear the vampires, seeing his lifeless body really does make you feel something, makes this feel like an early battle in what could be a long war. He was laying next to the vampires he killed, and out of respect, I wanted to move his body away from them and towards the light at the entrance to the cave. 
It might have been a nice gesture if I hadn't looted his robes to sell first. As it stands, I just ended up dashing his half-naked corpse across the snow and rocks, robbing him of whatever small dignity he salvaged with his heroic death. What follows is a fairly standard Skyrim dungeon. It's an enjoyable, if unremarkable, experience, and then we reach a massive cavern with a circular stone platform in the middle. Once again, we overhear two vampires discussing something, this time their reward for this mysterious discovery. They mention two names that we'll later learn about if you follow the vampire pathway, but their dialogue is a little too mustache twirling for my taste, and I think it undermines their evil by making it feel so cliched. Killing them, we solve a puzzle to reveal a strange sarcophagus, inside of which is probably the most beloved character in all of Skyrim, certainly the most three-dimensional. Where is... who sent you here? I was expecting someone... like me, at least. Vampire, yes. Her name is Serana, and she's hesitant to tell us more until we help her get to her family's home. Bringing her home is the only way this quest can progress. This works great if you were vampire curious. You'd have obvious motivation to meet a big, powerful vampire and request a reward for saving his daughter. If you're part of the Dawn Guard, though, taking the immortal vampire with an Elder Scroll back to her immortal father's giant castle seems less than ideal. And if you tell her this, she'll indicate that it's the only way to start figuring out why people are looking for her and what the bigger situation is. And at this point, we don't know enough about Serana to know that she seems like a fundamentally virtuous character. And so a member of the Dawnguard returning her to Castle Volkahar when they could or probably should bring her to Fort Dawnguard instead is strange. And we sort of lack a compelling reason to not kill Serana and take the scroll ourselves. The story requires the Dragonborn to be kind and gracious towards her, even though we haven't bonded with her enough to make that dynamic feel earned. I'm not saying this moment doesn't work at all for me, there's something classically chivalric in the noble hero returning a princess to a castle, and you could also speculate whether Serana is using any vampiric charms to woo the Dragonborn a bit. But just as a thought exercise, if we switched up this moment, I think reactions would be fairly different. If instead of it being Serana to collapse out of the monolith, it was someone like Agmir. Little blonde vampiric hunk with a scroll on his back saying, take me back to my mother please, vampire hunter. I think without that classic chivalric allure, or let's be honest, for a lot of players, attraction, the credulity of this moment is more easily strained. Serana is an interesting character though, so I don't mind that she's foisted upon the Dragonborn. The bond will become the heart of the DLC, and while it's still a very shallow relationship, it's one of the more interesting and ambitious ones that I think we've gotten in an Elder Scrolls game. The trip up north with her takes us to an old wooden jetty on the Sea of Ghosts, right next to Northwatch Keep. If players are taking their role as Serana's guardian seriously, they'll allow for a brief detour so the two of you can, uh, say hello to the local Thalmor contingent. <laughs> Having done our part to make Skyrim a better place, it's time to float across the icy waters to Castle Volkahar. This moment presents a narrative opportunity that's vital to take advantage of, especially in an open world game like Skyrim, where quiet, stationary moments are few and far between. This is a DLC that's structured around character, particularly the bond between these two characters. And yet here they are in one spot together without any other action happening and we just jump over the entire crossing by fading to black. And yes, important caveat, it's likely a casualty of its medium. The expense to animate a boat crossing in a game that would probably never use it again was probably seen as too high a price to pay for whatever narrative value the conversation would create. So while there are good reasons it might not have been feasible to happen here, in a game that was more curious about its characters or even invested in their players' ability to shape their own stories, this might have been a two-minute dialogue scene between the Dragonborn and Serana. Or again, if we didn't want to use the boat, it could have happened next to it. After this point, if you were the Dawnguard or the Vampires, your character is going to go out of their way to keep Serana safe. So a conversation that happens here could have been so important to actually making that bond feel earned, rather than the I want to protect the weirdly innocent vampire princess vibe that it has until Serana is fleshed out more in the search for her mother. This relationship is at the heart of the DLC. This story shines the brightest when both player and the Dragonborn believe what they're saying when they tell Harkon or Isran or Valerica that they're going to protect Serana. This relationship is literally written into the Elder Scrolls, referenced here with the darkness and light imagery. Darkness will mingle with light, 
and the night and the day will be as one. We can read that as the Dongard clashing with the vampires embodiments of the night. Or, for a Dongard hero, we can read that as a member of the Dongard mingling with Serana and bonding. And later, more explicitly, we get a specific allusion to the Dragonborn here with this. The second scroll declares that the blood of Cold Harbor's daughter will blind the eye of the dragon. Everyone thinks this is about the sun, and it could be. We'll later learn that the Snow Elves view the sun as an extension of Oriel's power. So the blood blinding the sun is the doomy gloomy reading of the prophecy that everyone else is working with in the game. But of course, we're a dragon too, and we'll later learn that Valerica is also a daughter of Cold Harbor. And so her daughter, or her blood, in the familial sense, Serana, will blind our character and turn them away from the fanaticism of Harkon or Isran. It's a clever prophecy in that it can apply regardless of your chosen faction. But it really all hinges on this relationship right here. And while it's the most thoughtful and developed character Bethesda has written in this game, that bar is kind of low. Serana doesn't really open up to the Dragonborn until this DLC's second act. And even then, it's a faint sketch of a person. Like so many of the social interactions in Skyrim, you sort of have to fill in the gaps yourself. Serana being the heart of this DLC, motivating our Dragonborn and making this a more human story, if we can call it that, is bold and interesting and I like that they took that risk. But then they need to commit to it and make us feel like we're connecting with a person and not an archetype with a twist. Before entering the castle, Serana asks the Dragonborn to let her take the lead. And as we enter the hall, Harkin calls out a booming greeting. My long lost daughter returns at last. I trust you have my Elder Scroll. After all these years, that's the first thing you ask me? Yes, I have the scroll. Serana is rightfully peeved that that's the first thing he asks about, but the Dragonborn's attention has likely been captured by the bloody mess around them in the Great Hall. And I think now is as good a time as any to talk about Skyrim's vampires and this faction's missed potential. I want to preface this by saying that my vampiric expertise leaves something to be desired. I've spent hours on Vampire Survivor, I've watched, I think, the first two seasons of What We Do in the Shadows, and when I was in fifth grade, I read the first couple of Twilight books in an attempt to connect with a girl I had a crush on. I'm not sure it worked, and she has since left the continent, so I think it's safe to chalk that down as an early L. When we think of vampires, I think most people's minds will jump to some version or adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, at least for those of us that grew up with the English canon. I don't think Dungard is really connected to that though. While it is using some vampiric tropes, it's more adapting from the general zeitgeist rather than any one work in particular. For years, scholars suggested that Vlad the Impaler was Stoker's inspiration for Dracula, but I think that the idea has since been somewhat debunked. There is something of Vlad the Impaler in Harkon, however, who massacred a thousand innocents to gain the attention of Molag Bal. There are also a few lines from Lord Byron's 1813 poem, The Jower, that's oddly applicable to Dongard, about how vampires are cursed to suck the blood of their relations. But first, on earth, as vampire sent, thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent, then ghostly haunt thy native place, and suck the blood of all thy race, they're from thy daughter, sister, wife, at midnight drain the stream of life. On both the Dongard and Vampiric path, Harkin is planning to find and kill either his wife or his daughter. It's Bethesda, so I'm not sure we can infer that any kind of connection is made intentionally, but vampires specifically targeting their spouse or family is something that's found in a lot of vampiric folklore. You mean you might be killed? Vampire fiction often involves a lot of sexual tension or erotic subtext, and Skyrim sort of leans into that side of it, but in the weirdest way. In Dracula, one of the more notorious scenes is this moment when Jonathan Harker encounters three young women in the castle. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing, and at the same time, some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest someday it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain, but it is the truth. It escalates a tiny bit more, but I will spare us all the horror of hearing my monotonous drone attempt to capture what is supposed to be a moment of sinful titillation. What, do you mean like something sexual? Let's move to a book with, thankfully, almost none of that, which is the first Twilight book. If you're not familiar with it, and I suppose congratulations if you're not, in the first book, Edward's connection to Bella is described as more of a hunger for her blood. We're understanding his yearning, his attraction, his desire, 
through this vampire prey connection before it starts to evolve into a romantic one. But you know, he literally hungers for her. He literally wants her body. And those elements obviously translate rather effectively into a love story, even if Stephanie Meyer couldn't stitch together a compelling plot around that. Also, this has bothered me for years, and this is the closest to the subject we'll ever get. So I just want to say, one of Bella's favorite books is Wuthering Heights. And in the third book, I think, I remember there being a detail about how her copy is breaking down from how many times she's read it. And like, okay, Bella, come back to us. Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights is effective in what it's doing, like far be it from me to bash any of the Bronte sisters, but let's be honest, it's a ridiculous comfort novel for a high schooler. It's a book steeped in emotional violence, cruelty, misery, and Bella's like, tra la 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 la, let's just jump back into this for the twelfth time. Suffice to say, I am dubious. And then we get to Skyrim, which, oof. Rather than spending the time to make any of its vampiric characters feel dangerously alluring or darkly charismatic, it just adopts suggestive language and imagery and kind of awkwardly stops there. I think this was in the base game too, but if the Dragonborn is a vampire then they can still do the classic vampire. Break into a house at night and suck on somebody's body while they sleep in their bed. Don't laugh kids, this is as spicy as it got back in the Penny Dreadful days, but the rest of the vampires in the game feel like any other enemy or character. Serana does refer to the ceremony she underwent as degrading, and I believe cites it as one of the reasons she won't marry the player, but that's about as detailed as Skyrim gets. We get slightly suggestive language, there's a vampire seduction power which is used during the campaign to turn someone into a thrall, and then the rest is mostly the oddly intimate way that the vampires in Castle Volcahar consume their prey. Harkon has a cage and a torture rack in his bedroom despite the fact that he's like 13 paces away from his dining hall. And there's a lot of weird mentions of pets and masters, and Bethesda made the captured humans just make strange moaning sounds when you interact with them. Well, was this really necessary? It ends up being more amusing than anything else, though still somewhat successful in creating a totally different atmosphere to vanilla Skyrim, because much like Victorian era Britain that was captivated by Bram Stoker's Dracula and other vampire fiction, Skyrim is fairly prudish and puritanical. There's practically no emotional intimacy, there's literally no physical intimacy of any kind, you don't even kiss your husband or wife at your own wedding. So this sudden eruption of hedonistic debauchery feels different and scandalous in a somewhat fun way, even if it is still more awkward than anything. And so it's weirdly that element of vampire fiction that's the most prominent in Skyrim. There's little that's uncanny about vampires in Skyrim because this world is too grim and fantastical already. The highbrow evil of the vampire doesn't contrast with the world of Skyrim the way it does with our world. The vampire threat is further diminished by their overuse. These are not cunning, dangerous creatures that make us fear the dark. They're mustache twirling, dark robe wearing fodder that frighten nobody so long as they have a stash of cure disease potions. So they're not that unusual compared to the rest of Skyrim's monsters, and they're not that dangerous by comparison either. Their primary distinction is this twisted pseudo-sexual element. This is the only time of the game that Skyrim appears to depict the body as anything other than a chunk of flesh to be looted or foosed off a mountain. Dawnguard keeps its vampires fairly generic, and that's fine. The family dynamic of Harkon, Serana, and Valerica should have been more than enough to propel this story. And for this first and second act at least, I think it is. As our reward for returning Serana to him, Harkon offers to turn the Dragonborn into a vampire lord. The choice would be more interesting if the vampires, particularly these ones, weren't so obviously villainous. The choice could have also been more interesting if, despite their evil appearance, the Dragonborn had just experienced such a dangerous event that they felt powerless to stop, say, the destruction of the Hall of the Vigilance, for example. That they might have felt compelled to accept this power anyway to try to use it against the vampires. This is also on the heels of a main quest that focused on the responsible wielding of power. A dragonborn accepting this power of a vampire lord at the expense of needing to feed on and victimize the people of Skyrim flies directly in the face of everything that they were supposed to learn in the main quest. Harkon sees humans as beneath him, so he doesn't really care. And maybe by this time we're supposed to understand that the dragonborn might share that opinion. But if that's a tension Bethesda is going for, it doesn't set it up at all. So instead of a complex moral choice, it's really only a tempting gameplay one. Many players will become a vampire lord because it looks cool and it's different. So we make our choice that will matter less than we expect, and rejecting Harkon's offer seems like the right course of action, though I'll touch on the big changes for the vampire side of the storyline as well. 
Harkon expels the Dragonborn from the castle, and they make their way across Skyrim, back to the rift in Fort Dongard. When we arrive, it's under attack by a small team of vampires, whose plan to assault the extremely defensible fortress involves charging loudly up the front-facing path. I have no idea why this moment is here. If we assume they're following Harkon's orders, it undermines his intelligence that, without any planning, despite the fort literally being built on and around a series of caves and tunnels, he sends a tiny team to attack the fort head-on, none of whom can or will transform into a vampire lord. It's probably my main gripe with this DLC, its vampires don't feel substantially different to magic-wielding bandits. These creatures are supposed to be the manifestation of darkness, a dreadful vestige of the old world that flourishes in the shadow cast by civilization, and yet in this and every subsequent encounter, they throw themselves at their enemies like the ravenous hounds they keep as pets. We explain to Isran who we found in Dim Hollow Crypt, and that the situation connected back to a vampire lord, and that they now have an Elder Scroll in their possession. They what? And you didn't stop them? You didn't secure the scroll? Oh, great question, Isran, because yes, while retrieving the scroll in this situation was probably unwise, we had the entire journey up with Serana to try to take it from her. These three replies we're given are all essentially lies. We're lying to cover up the fact that our character couldn't bring themselves to harm Serana or to leave her in danger. Which is interesting, I like that we're now keeping a secret from Isran and that there's a natural conflict there. I just wish it felt more like a choice we made as a result of something rather than something predetermined. Is it feasible that a dragonborn would want to protect Serana on a gut feeling? Absolutely, but that's such a rich narrative moment worthy of exploration, whether back in Dim Hollow or down the road, but we never really bring it up again. The dragonborn Serana trust and friendship is just the new status quo. Isran asks the Dragonborn for help in tracking down some old colleagues, so we're off to help him get the band back together. Both of them are surprised to hear that he wants or needs their help. Isran needing someone else's help. Never thought I'd hear that. I'm afraid he's a few years too late. Isran? Wants me? No, you must be mistaken. He made it exceedingly clear the last time we spoke that he had no interest in my help. I find it hard to believe he's changed his mind. He said some very hurtful things to me before I left. Isran's obsession pushed its friends away a long time ago, and in the second act, we'll come to learn that Harkon was fundamentally changed by his obsession with a prophecy. We never get these two characters in a room together until Harkon is a pile of sticky goo, which is a shame because they're very similar. Isran feels like he's the only one who can put a force together strong enough to stop the vampires, feels that he's responsible for keeping Skyrim safe from the dark. We'll later learn from Serana that Harkon's so compelled by the prophecy because he believes, as the de facto ruler of Skyrim's most powerful vampires, that he owes it to his species to deliver them a world in which they can thrive rather than hide. It's that obsession that blinds both of them to the pain they're causing the people they love. Harkon loses his family and Isran lost his friends. And then there's the Dragonborn, who is blinded by Serana. But unlike Isran, unlike Harkon, the Dragonborn makes no sacrifice. In true, annoying Skyrim fashion, the Dragonborn can have it all with no compromises. Can being the operative word there, because there is a fascinating sacrifice that the Dragonborn has the option to make, but more on that later. I think this DLC would have been better served if working with Serana meant that you gave up your role with the Dawnguard, and the resulting missions would be more difficult or complicated as a result of not having their support. Walking the more difficult path with just Serana because we deem it righteous would have made the narrative experience feel so much more satisfying, it would have felt like a weightier choice. Instead, Isran is just a little sassy, and we leave it there. Having fetched his old companions, we re-enter Fort Dongard to a bit of a strange scene. Isran towers over the two of them, looking down from the stone balcony. The stones in the middle of the room are suddenly awash in sunlight, and Isran watches to see everyone's reactions before he lowers the fort's internal defenses. It's another nice moment of characterization for all of them. We're being shown Isran's paranoia rather than just being told about it all the time, and I like the way that his old friends just exchange a somewhat exasperated look. With the team back together and the Dawnguard starting to get back on its feet, we're ready to continue our search for answers into the Vampire Threat and the Elder Scroll. It turns out we might not have to look that far. In the meantime, we're going to get to the bottom of why a vampire showed up here looking for you. Let's go have a little chat with it, shall we? Serana is back. She's escaped her father's castle and traveled all the way across Skyrim to a fort full of vampire hunters to talk to us. 
And that's where I think our first act wraps up for the Dongard side. With a growing mystery around Serana and the Elder Scroll, and the Dongard starting to claw its way back to its former glory. The story's clunky beginning keeps it from building any momentum, and the conversation with Serana in the crypt and on the way to the castle just implies the start of a strong emotional bond, rather than actually creating one. But there's a lot to like in this first act. I like that we're getting a story that's built around character rather than opposing a tedious and vague evil. I really enjoy the moments where Bethesda lets its characters be characters, lets the story breathe in a way that it rarely did in its main quest. Before we reunite with Serana in Isran's grisly little bedroom, let's take a brief detour to a darker timeline, one in which the Dragonborn accepts Harkon's offer and joins his nocturnal court. I've already touched a bit on how I think Skyrim picks the strangest and most boring parts of vampire fiction to integrate into its characterizations, but seeing just how little has changed on the vampiric side of this main quest really emphasizes just how much potential is wasted in this DLC. After this first mission, the quests are essentially identical, with changes to the dialogue being so slight that I think it's really only worth covering this next quest separately. I do want to note that the side quests that come along with this faction are more in line with what you'd expect from a vampire story, and that there are some creative and novel side quests that can be enjoyable. If you accept Harkon's gift, he awkwardly chomps at your neck and the screen dips to black, the player waking in his dark shrine to Molag Ball. Harkon walks the player through their new powers, and while it's not required, you're highly encouraged to practice your new powers on one of the humans Harkon has captured. I like that it's optional because it still leaves the door open for your character to try to be a virtuous vampire. One of the few lessons of this main quest is that vampires aren't a monolith, that some of them, most notably Serana, are still good people. Our first quest as a fledgling vampire lord is to refill the Bloodstone Chalice. While walking us through our mission, Garen explains to the Dragonborn that Harkon's court is a ruthless and individualistic struggle, and we meet two of the major players, Vingalmo and Orthjolf, Harkon's primary advisors. We heard both of those names mentioned by Lokil back in Dim Hollow Crypt, and they'll come up again before this quest is over. Weird side note, I'm not sure if this was a bug or not, but I got somewhat bored during Garen's dialogue and wanted to transform into a vampire lord to float around the castle and see if my bat form would knock the dishes off the table. But even though I was in the castle and part of their faction, my transformation caused everyone in the castle to become quite cross and try to kill me. You'd expect this kind of reception with the Dawnguard, of course, but I thought I was amongst my blood-sucking brethren, so I had to reload and my latest save was before I was three. turned, which meant I had to sit through Harkon's three-minute tutorial again. Excruciating. I'm glad I did though, because this trip to Redwater Den is much more fun than fetching Isran's old friends. The den is wretched, and inside we get another little moment that I really appreciate, a run-in with an Imperial deserter who recognizes us. What? Who? You're that one from Helgen. Barely made it out of there myself. I hurt my back and I... I just need something for the pain. It's 10 seconds, but this moment breathes so much life into this world. We're reminded of the horrors of Helgen. Through the lens of our heroic exceptionalism, that was our lucky break, the start of our grand adventure. For this common Imperial soldier though, he survived at the cost of the only thing he had to offer his empire, his body. The pain, the purposelessness, it's a tragedy in three sentences. And when we emerge from clearing the crypt, we find his lifeless body next to his chair. Once again, what was just another adventure for us had deadly, horrible consequences for others. We drink our sample of skooma and awaken in a cell somewhere in a deep cavern. The vampire outside our cell will only say that he doesn't converse with his prey, oddly not acknowledging the fact that we're obviously a fellow vampire. We make it a bit more obvious though, and start slowly ripping and tearing our way through him and his cohort. After fighting our way to the springs, we're ambushed by two vampires from Harkon's court, one lackey from each of the courtly schemers. They monologue at the Dragonborn before also revealing that they plan to betray each other as well. This disloyalty, this ambition, is a consequence of the power-obsessed culture of the vampires, but we learn it's an element that Harkon approves of, a constant battle of strength and wits. I love this idea, and I appreciate that we spend time both hearing about and experiencing this element. But when we zoom out and examine how the vampires behave in gameplay, 
it undermines a lot of that characterization. Neither of these lackeys transform into a vampire lord. They also don't try to exercise any cunning and ambush the dragonborn, maybe try to talk us into handing over the chalice, try to use the aristocratic bureaucracy of the court to try to deceive us. Up against a powerful foe, they decide that their best course of action is to simply attack head on, but not before delivering a cartoon villain monologue first so we have plenty of time to prepare. It's all just brute strength over cunning or guile, and I guess I just want something different from my vampires. What follows is another bright spot in the campaign, a conversation with Harkon that plays out in his room in front of his fire. His chair is massive, another throne, and the only place for the dragonborn to sit is in a much smaller, less ornate chair. It's a great detail, and it's fitting for this court that fixates on power and privilege. Of course they're going to make sure that there's a power chair in Harkon's bedroom. And what plays out next is actually quite a well-executed scene. Hargon confiding in the dragonborn about the prophecy, the two lit only by the small fire a few paces in front of them. As you know, vampires are powerful, but we have limits. Our great enemy is the sun. And until recently, it's an enemy we've had no way to fight. For centuries, I searched for an answer to this problem. I found an old prophecy written by a moth priest. Those scholars who read the Elder Scrolls. The prophecy tells of a time in which vampires will gain power over the sun and will no longer fear its tyranny. This moment is wonderfully done. The writing, the setting, the vocal performance. It's the most humanizing moment that Harkon gets. He sounds paternal, warm, and it's up to the player's interpretation how much of this is an act. We know how important power and hierarchy is to him. But with how he's laid the scene here, the chairs, the fire, the secrecy, for a moment we might delude ourselves into thinking we're special, that we're, perhaps, his equal. He gives us the context before he tells the court. He knows that we have a unique bond with Serana. It's all well done from a character perspective, and yet, the tyranny of the sun. You might be wondering, and understandably so, what tyranny? Serana is fine to walk around in the sun. If turned into a vampire, the player can also do so, though their health and stamina will no longer regenerate naturally at the highest state of vampirism. Harkon's entire motivation, his obsession that pushed away his family, is about conquering the day itself for the good of all vampires. And yet in the game, we've only ever seen daylight portrayed as an inconvenience. The story doesn't do enough to make this problem feel like something that warrants Harkon sacrificing his daughter or that would justify how much attention this mission draws to his vampires and vampires everywhere. If the sun's effects were truly as bad as Harkon claims, and we saw and felt that in-game, then the conflict in this quest would be much more interesting. If Serana, who we care about, was noticeably hurt by the sunlight, if we saw more sympathetic vampires have their lives ruined because of it, we might feel more compelled by this goal. But instead, we deflate so much narrative believability because the gameplay demands convenience. His goal is absurd, and unless, like Harkon, you view humans and the rest of Skyrim as beneath vampires, just so ridiculously evil that it's difficult to take him seriously when the vast majority of players will see this as an extinction-level event, not the ascension of the vampires. Let's end the tyranny of the sun, catastrophically shattering non-vampiric societies because I'm uncomfortable if I go outside between 8.07am and 6.44pm. But if we suspend disbelief and accept that vampires are actually suffering, even if we don't see or experience it, then if you squint, there is a sympathetic case to be made for Harkon. He sees himself as the Lord of Skyrim's vampires, their leader. And with the knowledge of this prophecy, he feels like he owes it to his subjects to try to make their world as safe and viable for them as he can. He's willing to sacrifice a daughter and a wife that he, at least at one point, loved, all in the name of a better world. We don't get enough from him to really make us feel that, but I still appreciate this scene here for how well it handles things. But that's how the first act ends on the vampiric side, with both sides being summoned for a debrief that will lay the groundwork for our second act. As disappointing as I find Skyrim's vampires, there are still some great moments on this side. I love the detail of the despondent Helgen veteran, and though it doesn't redeem his ridiculous plan, this scene with Harkon is thoughtfully done. There's been a lot of good moments in this campaign, and there'll be plenty more before Journey's End. We pick up our second act back in the Dawnguard timeline, Eastron having just summoned us up the stairs to answer for Serana's arrival. 
For a bedroom, Isron's walls seem to have an unusually high amount of blood-soaked skulls gathering dust on its bookshelves. Like Harkon, he's got a torture rack in his room, blood splatters on the floor, trophies on his walls. The parallels between these two characters are effectively drawn, between the obsession and the brutality, and I'd praise it more if Dongard actually did something with this idea in its third act. What we have now is just enough to come away from this DLC, reflecting on how obsessions can blind us and do more harm than good. Harkon lost his family and ultimately his life by fixating on the prophecy, and Isran pushed away his friends with his hardline approach. By the journey's end, he seems to have matured a bit on that front, becoming ever so slightly more accepting, but I ended up wanting more out of him. The only line we get from him after killing Harkon, a dark mirror of himself, is telling Serana that, I think perhaps, I think you did more than that. You have my thanks. Which is fine. He's acknowledged Serana's heroism and sacrifice, he's thanked her, but he doesn't welcome her back to Fort Dongar, doesn't offer her a new home now that she's shattered her old one. This wouldn't even have to be done in dialogue. It's believable that Isran wouldn't want to explicitly express anything, but a more satisfying conclusion to this arc might be like, I don't know, well, like a room he sets aside for her in Fort Dongard without saying anything, somewhere dark and cozy. Instead, all we get is that single gruff line seconds after she's killed her father. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. Setting the patricide aside for now, and sorry, I know that's a phonetic mess, but you can't turn down the chance to say setting the patricide aside. Serana tells the dragonborn about the prophecy and what learning about it did to her father. He just became absorbed, obsessed. He was kind of sick, actually. She thinks finding out what's written on the Elder Scrolls might be the key to stopping her father, so we're off to find a moth priest who will be able to read it. Isran suggests talking to innkeepers and carriage drivers, anyone who'd meet a traveler. I like that this quest isn't just another white arrow on the map to follow. There's a bit more dedication to the roleplay and Skyrim's world with this added step. Before we start our search, we can talk to Serana to find out a bit more about her and her family's dark history. The first vampire came from Molag Bal. She was not a willing subject, but she was still the first. Molag Bal is a powerful Daedric Lord, and his will is made reality. For those willing to subjugate themselves, he will still bestow the gift, but they must be powerful in their own right before earning his trust. The ceremony was... degrading. Let's not revisit that. And there's a lot to unpack there. We can see why power is at the core of the vampire's philosophy. They can trace that back to Molag Ball. They have to be powerful first. I think on the vampire path, Harkon mentions that he had to sacrifice a thousand innocents. And that personal power makes it all the more meaningful when they're willing to bow before Molag Ball. It's the part of their culture we're being constantly reminded of. Power and the pursuit of power is valued over everything. And it corrupted Serana's father and it's torn her family apart. She also talks about how degrading the ceremony was, and one thing I appreciate about this DLC is that this isn't a situation where we meet Serana and fix her over the course of our journey. If this DLC ended with a Serana wedding, I think it would have done a disservice to her character. Skyrim takes her character's trauma as seriously as a game like Skyrim is able to. And what I also appreciate is that if you ask her if she thinks about curing herself, she says, I can't think of any reason I'd want to lose this gift. Especially after what I did to get it. She thinks of it like a gift that she's earned, and after hearing about how she got it, it's easy to understand why she thinks that way. But if you ask if she regrets it, she says, Nobody's ever asked me that before. I... I don't know. I think mostly I hate what it's done to my family. Part of the reason Serana is so effective as a character in this DLC is because she feels more human, for lack of a better word, than everyone else in Skyrim. She doesn't know everything, doesn't have an answer for every question. When we talk to her, we're not getting a 10 second sound bite that encapsulates her entire personality. I think Serana shines the brightest during the Soul Cairn mission, so we're gonna keep moving for now. Before tracking down the Moth Priest, I wanted to take the time and upgrade my crossbow. So I started hunting down the enhanced crossbow schematics with Serana. The first enhancement was in a Dwemer ruin, and fighting to its depths led to the inevitable confrontation with the Falmer. I love that on the Dongard path, we're reintroduced to the Falmer and their odd relationship to the Dwemer ruins. In the third act, we'll learn more information about their tragic origins. Here in this ruin, one thing I notice is that a lot of the Falmer tents seem to be pitched around the old Dwemer fountains. The Falmer are blind, so they can't enjoy the visuals of the fountain, but the prevalence of this tent placement makes me think that there's something about the sound of the water that they find soothing. 
We'll circle back to that in Act 3 as well. This isn't limited to this ruin either. So many of the larger Falmer encampments seem built around natural or Dwemer water features. Hunting down these Dwemer schematics also reveals how many of Skyrim's bandits are starting to turn their attention to the Dwemer ruins, trying to harness or salvage these parts of the old world to make their living. That's another theme that this DLC kind of sets up but never really resolves. The old world is creeping back into the new one. Vampires once again stalk the night. What was once buried in Dwemer ruins is starting to be excavated en masse by local bandits. Fort Dongard or even the Elder Scrolls themselves are a perfect example of this. But we don't really address that as clearly or coherently as I would have liked. There is a resolution to that tension by finding Oriel's bow, this ultimate symbol of ancient power, and not using it to dominate. I think we can create a harmony between Skyrim's past and present. Serana and the Dragonborn also represent a unification of the old Skyrim with the new Skyrim. Defeating the vampires, stopping these bandits, having the bow but not wielding it for evil, you could squint and come to a somewhat satisfying conclusion there. I think what's missing for me is Skyrim's inevitable confrontation with itself. This is a land of reckless violence, it's a regression from Oblivion Cyrodiil. Were it not for our intervention, a false prophecy could have destabilized an entire continent. We'll address that more in our third act, but it's part of why I find this DLC's conclusion somewhat unsatisfying. There are so many interesting threads that are introduced, so many compelling ideas that fit perfectly with the world we've inhabited, and yet we kind of ignore it all once Harkon is converted to a goopy paste. To start the hunt for the scrolls, I went to my favorite carriage driver. I didn't necessarily need to, for whatever reason my brain has decided that it doesn't need to remember anything about long division, but it will forever retain the information that the moth priest carriage can be found near Dragon Bridge. Still, I gave Bjorlam 171 golds because, frankly, the man needed it. Charging 20 coins for a ride to Riften is ludicrously undercharging, and armed with my new information, I made for Dragon Bridge. The view from the titular Dragon Bridge is stunning, and it's impossible to not stop and admire it for a moment. Skyrim is a land of blood and beauty, violence and vistas. Playing Skyrim so soon after Starfield, I was struck by how uniquely captivating this land is. Nothing in Starfield could make me feel this way, and I don't know why. Maybe it's just my preference for fantasy, but I'd also personally rank this world above the ones we've gotten in Dragon Age or The Witcher. That's not to say those worlds aren't effective or beautiful in their own right, but something about Skyrim just feels different. The remains of the cart are easy to spot, turned on its side right off the road. The Imperial Escort lies dead next to it, and a few paces ahead is the body of one of the vampires in the attack. Skyrim tells us to investigate the scene, once again trying to commit to a more hands-off questing experience. But like asking innkeepers or carriage drivers, it's mostly superficial. In this case, the quest arrow points right to the body of the dead vampire, and once you take the note off his corpse, the game will instruct you to read it. Across the bridge, closer to the cave, there's another stopped cart, this one's still upright. Reading a nearby journal reveals that it was a husband and wife, each laying dead on a different side of their wagon. I wanted to move the husband's body closer, so I started dragging it over when Serana noticed some vampires down the road, and in what I'm sure she thought was a very helpful contribution, raised the body of the wife to use as a meat shield. When the last vampire finally took her down, you could hear a lifeless as her body disintegrated into ash. After the fight, I moved the husband's body over to the tiny white pile of ash that was once his wife. Not exactly the dignified rest I had pictured for them, and hopefully soon someone takes Serana aside and teaches her some necromancy etiquette. With the enhanced Dwemer crossbow, sharpshooting the vampires in the cave is a joy. Dexie and the Moth Priest is still under the control of the vampires when you free him, but a pair of crossbow bolts help sober him up. I don't want to be around anymore. But a pair of crossbow bolts help sober him up. He's appreciative of our efforts and is happy to help us, and sets off back to Fort Don Guard. Back at the fort, he reads Serana's Elder Scroll. He has a vision of Oriel's bow, and we get that line I mentioned earlier that applies to the Dragonborn Serana relationship. Darkness will mingle with light, and the night and the day will be as one. 
He says that we'll need to find two other Elder Scrolls to discover the bow's location and power, and it's this quest that is going to make up the rest of our second act. Serana thinks her mother has one of them, and remembers that she was going into hiding. Somewhere that my father would never search. Castle Volkahar fits that description, and Serana says that her mother used to keep a garden, and that... She used to say that my father couldn't stand the place. Too peaceful. So we're off to infiltrate the castle full of power-hungry homicidal vampires, something that's surprisingly easier done than said. But before we begin our hunt for the Elder Scrolls, let's take a quick detour to the vampiric timeline to cover the last major difference in the main quest. Following his private conversation with the Dragonborn, Harkon gathers his court and gives them their marching orders. Now that I have reclaimed one of my Elder Scrolls, we must find a moth priest to read it. I have spread false rumors about the discovery of an Elder Scroll in Skyrim to lure a moth priest here. I love that he calls it my Elder Scroll, even though it's an object of insane cosmic power, and he can't even read it. Archon's arrogance is just wonderfully conveyed here. We've also learned that he's lured the Moth Priest to Skyrim, whereas on the Dongard path, we just hear from Isran that he's spotted an Imperial Scholar of some kind on the road. It's likely we're seeing the fruits of Harkon's labor on that pathway without even knowing it. Tracking down the Moth Priest is identical except for the combatants in the cave. Instead of vampires, you're fighting the Dongard, but it's not anybody we'd recognize, which feels like such a missed opportunity to give players a moment of regret or a moment of gleeful, devious evil. Instead, they're just fodder for your spells or your claws. Rather than helping you willingly, Dexian needs to be turned into your thrall through your vampire seduction power. I wasn't sure how this worked, so when I tried to use it the first time, I missed, and you can only use it once a day. So I had to awkwardly wait 24 hours to try to seduce him again. Despite being your thrall, Dexian's lines are fairly similar to his lines on the Dongard path, both in the reading and down the line. Speaking to Harkon after Dexian reads the scroll reveals that he knows where we might start our search for both scrolls. Harkon says that he heard the dragon scroll was lost in the bowels of a Dwemer ruin, something that nobody else in Skyrim seems to have known except Septimus Cygnus. It makes sense given Harkon's age and fixation on power, and it's another small detail that I really appreciate in this DLC. Back to our Dawnguard timeline, Serana and the Dragonborn find it surprisingly easy to sneak into the castle. Harkon's fixation on power and glory meant that he never really cared about something as peaceful as a garden, and sealed up the hall leading to it when his wife disappeared. That, combined with the lack of windows in the castle, for obvious reasons, makes sneaking in through the side entrance fairly trivial. I do want to note the delicious irony that it's the servant's entrance to the castle that ends up being Harkon's undoing. Of course this guy who's fixating on killing the sun and imprisons and feeds on humans without a second thought will have overlooked this unsophisticated side entrance that the servants used. Serana has lines of dialogue about how strange it is to be back in the castle, and one of my favorite through lines with her character is how her upbringing has shaped her worldview. If you talk to her in the ruins here, she mentions how her parents almost never let her off the island, so she spent a lot of time exploring the castle. That leads to another one of my favorite details about her, which is her constant references to books and stories, implying that she did a lot of reading when she was younger because she was so bored and lonely. When we met her back in the crypt and she mentioned her father, she references the narrative cliché. My father and I don't really get along. Ugh, saying it out loud makes it sound so... common. Little girl who doesn't get along with her father. Read that story a hundred times. And then, before our search for the Moth Priest, she says, The tale of the great Moth Priest hunt. Not something I'd want to read. If you take her to Windhelm or Solitude, she'll also reference books. They used to call Windhelm the City of Kings. In my books, anyway. I'd read stories about the Solitude Windmill, but I didn't expect it to be that big. And it's here that we realize why that is. It's not just a romantic streak in her, it's a product of her upbringing. On the Dongard side, I think it's part of what motivates her turn to the Dongard, part of what motivates her to stop her father. She has this inherent sense of virtue and romanticism from an adolescence of literature. Just keep her away from Argonian maids. This mission has so much dialogue from Serana, and it's one of the few times across the main game or the DLCs that Skyrim seems actually interested in exploring its own characters. I like how it's done in the Moondial Courtyard. Serana walks around exploring the Withered Garden. I used to walk through here after evening meals. It was beautiful once. It all sounds very idyllic until you remember what meals means for a vampire. 
At other points in this quest, Serana will have additional dialogue paths open, but only when you're in specific areas of the castle, so you have to stop in the middle of combat or exploration to interact with her. Since this is one of the only times in the entire game that a character has this much context-based dialogue, I'm guessing that a lot of players miss this because we've never been conditioned to expect it. And it's a shame because it's some of the best character work Skyrim does. I think I prefer the Bioware approach for moments like this, where upon entering a room that's important to a companion, a dialogue launches automatically and you can choose to have the conversation or tell them something like, there's no time for this and get back to playing the game. That way the story moment is presented as an option, but players who genuinely don't care can quickly opt out and get back to the action. One of the conversations you can miss happens inside this tower accessible through the Moondial passageway. Asking about the tower gives the Dragonborn the option to ask about Serana's family and whether she was close to them. My father... No, not really. I did spend a lot of time with my mother, but she saw me more like a protege than a daughter. She then asks about the Dragonborn's parents, a moment that will probably take players by surprise because this is one of the few times Skyrim ever allows the player character to articulate some piece of their backstory. If you hit her with the old fantasy protagonist, I never knew my parents, I grew up alone, she says. I know how that feels. I mean, I know it isn't the same thing, but I was a pretty lonely child myself. Not as much. Let's, uh... Let's just keep going. Is this awkward and believable flirting in an Elder Scrolls game? I thought love was just telling people it was a fine day with them around. But in the tower of this dark and blood-soaked castle, Bethesda has written a genuine conversation between two people who have some level of affection towards each other. It's these moments that make the Serana Dragonborn relationship feel authentic and genuine, and could conceivably motivate a vampiric Dragonborn to go against Harkon if it means protecting Serana. For the Dongar Dragonborn, maybe we're finally putting words to the emotions felt back in Dim Hollow Crypt that made them want to take Serana home. I still wish we got more characterization there, or that the situation was handled in a way that made more sense, but I still like these conversations here in Act 2. Inside her mother's secret laboratory is an entrance to the Soul Cairn, the place where souls are sent if they're expended in soul trap sorceries. You gather the ingredients and, before the ritual to open it, can check in with Serana about how she feels about locating her mother. Once again, she's surprised somebody asked, surprised that someone is treating her like a person rather than an asset. Then she adds her blood, and the portal to the Soul Cairn opens. But like most journeys to an underworld, there's a price that needs to be paid. In this case, it's our life, kind of. The Soul Cairn is... Well, hungry, for lack of a better word. It's trying to take your life essence as payment. There might be, but I don't think you're going to like it. Vampires aren't counted among the living. I could probably go through there without a problem. Not your first choice, I guess? Maybe. We could just pay the toll another way. It wants a soul, so we give it a soul. Yours. Which, okay, this is supposed to be a big moment, but before we discuss it, I want to note her wording right there. Pay the toll. Which the game's subtitles puts in quotation marks as its own phrase. It's another nice example of Serana's awareness of narrative and how much it shaped her. She's looking at this moment like a catabasis, a descent into the underworld. She's thinking of stories that require a toll. The most well-known from our world is probably Charon from Greek mythology, who some in Greece believed required a toll in the form of a coin to ferry souls into the underworld. You'll see this payment referred to as Charon's Obel. I don't know what mythology Serana is drawing this phrase from, but it's clear that it's also a recurring enough idea in the Elder Scrolls universe to warrant her using this phrase, pay the toll. Serana sees this moment the same way that we, the player, do, and that's because, like us, Serana is seeing this adventure through the lens of story, whereas to our Dragonborn, it's just their life, another adventure to protect the realm and Serana. But now for the choice itself, which is ridiculously weightless. To be turned into a vampire by Serana, or to be... ...a bit weaker when we travel through the Soul Cairn, but we might be able to fix that once we're inside. This choice is so obviously the easier one, especially because the majority of Dongard leaning builds are going to be stealth archers anyway to take advantage of the new crossbows. You can even go on a short quest to get your soul back and remove the debuff. And yet this is presented as a tough decision. Serana even tells the player to take their time with it. But what? How are these two options even remotely equivalent? 
At this point, most players might not know about the cure for vampirism, so the option is for a member of the Dawn Guard to submit to a life of cursed immortality as a vampire lord, or to have an itty bitty part of their soul trapped that will take them a hop, skip, and a jump to retrieve? To paraphrase EA Sports, what if we took this option away from the players? As it stands, it's too easy to take the soul trap and temporary debuff in a game that's not that challenging to begin with. But forcing players to become a vampire to enhance that shared connection with Serana, to inject an entirely new tension into their relationship with Isran and the Dawnguard, and to be forced to reconcile their ideas of goodness with the dark reality of being a vampire lord, that's so much more interesting. We have our motive, we're doing this to save Skyrim and to keep Serana safe. It's conceivable that a Dongar Dragonborn would be willing to make this sacrifice. Especially if they're reading their connection with Serana as a romantic one, the temptation to join her in immortality is obviously appealing, and there's a lot of good that they might bring to the world as a vampire. If this was our only way to enter the Soul Cairn, then Bethesda might have taken the time to create interesting and complicated consequences for this action. Instead, because it's a choice, and a choice that not many players will make, the consequences are mostly ignored. We'll touch on those consequences later, because here, for the sake of a more interesting story, I became a vampire. I promise to try and make this as painless as possible. Hold still. Talking to Serana after being turned, all she'll say is, Let's go. My mother must be waiting on the other side of that thing. That's it? We literally became a vampire in the name of this quest. We became a vampire so she wouldn't have to go in there alone, and that's her only line of dialogue? One detail I do like, and I don't know how deliberate this was, is that if Serana turns the Dragonborn, it's a quick little chomp and then you're off to the Soul Cairn. It's quick and weirdly seamless. But back at the start of this quest line, if you accept Harkon's gift and he does it, the Dragonborn passes out and wakes up hours later in Harkon's shrine to Molag Ball. Serana mentions that the turning of someone is an intimate act, so maybe it's our existing bond and trust with Serana that makes this turning so quick and painless. Whereas with Harkon, it almost claims your life. The Soul Cairn is a strange place, part graveyard, part gothic ruin. Nothing is alive here, the trees are warped and lifeless, bones litter the ground, and skeletons stalk the ruins. The ghosts of expended souls walk the paths despondent. Even the monotony of this purple and black realm is fitting for its purpose. It feels like a twisted purgatory, like a place that's between true life or true death. Flying through the Soul Cairn as a newly formed vampire lord makes the journey go by faster, and before long we find Serana's mother trapped behind a magical barrier. She is less than pleased to see us here. So how has it come to pass that a vampire hunter is in the company of my daughter? It pains me to think you'd travel with Serana under the guise of her protector in an effort to hunt me down. I love this moment. Even after centuries apart from her daughter, Valerica still isn't taking her seriously, doesn't think of her as an individual. Just like she saw Serana as an asset to keep away from Harkon, she now accuses us of using her daughter as an asset to track her down. Not only does this betray her objectification of her daughter, but it's also a hint of the same vanity that Harkon has. Does she really think she's important or powerful enough to warrant a vampire hunter either becoming a vampire or trapping their own soul, fighting through the soul cairn, and trying to manipulate Serana all for killing someone who hasn't been seen on the continent in centuries? It's just a nice little beat. The characterization in Dongard was the one thing that consistently surprised me. Valerica explains that by rescuing Serana, we've endangered her. It wasn't just the scroll she was hiding, it was her daughter's blood. The second scroll declares that the blood of Cold Harbor's daughter will blind the eye of the dragon. We've now confirmed that Harkon's plan requires sacrificing either Serana or Valerica, using her blood to blind the sun. And earlier we noted how well this prophecy applies to Serana and the Dragonborn as well. Our affection for her is possibly blinding us, keeping us from our vampire slaying duties. Valerica is willing to give us the scroll, but she can't. The ideal masters of the Soul Cairn, mysterious beings that rule over it, tricked her and she's in hiding behind this barrier. She thought she could bargain with him, but she was wrong. Like Harkon, her arrogance is costing her. Harkon's pushed his family away, and Valerica saw her trapped in this tiny part of the Soul Cairn for centuries. Bringing the barrier down requires defeating the skeletal keepers across the Soul Cairn. Being a vampire makes things easy. The life drain and added mobility from the gliding and the bat dash allows you to fight from a distance. Out in the Soul Cairn, you'll also run into a familiar face to series veterans. How does anyone expect me to write my opus with all of these rude interruptions? He seems like an alright fellow, we'll probably talk about him again one day. 
With a barrier down, we can return to Valerica, who leads us into an arena. The dragon that guards the soul cairn descends and must be bested in order to claim the scroll. Having two powerful mages at your side makes the fight trivial, and before long, Valerica is leading the two of you to the scroll's hiding place. Valerica won't be coming back with you, though. If I return to Tamriel, that increases Harkon's likelihood of bringing the tyranny of the sun to fruition. The nobility of this gesture is somewhat lessened by the phrasing of her goodbye. And promise me you'll keep my daughter safe. She's the only thing of value I have left. Well, okay then. Serana doesn't really say a goodbye here, instead we just awkwardly run off. Just outside the ruins, the dragon, newly reformed, swoops down to greet us. He wants us to summon him when we need him in the Soul Cairn, and calls the player a fellow Dova. Interestingly, on this playthrough, I hadn't actually done any of the main quest. I was doing this on a fresh character and got most of my levels from training with a special elf friend in Riverwood, so I didn't know I was dragonborn yet. You tell him that you're not a dragon, and he says, Forgive me. My instinct was to grant you this title. I am uncertain why. Perhaps one day it will become clear to both of us. Which is good attention to detail, but if we were to don our fun police hats, it creates another kind of plot hole, because if dragons have some instinct about the dragonborn, then Alduin was feet away from one at multiple points in Helgen and didn't realize it at all. The second scroll retrieved, we escape the Soul Cairn. Now that the truth about Harkon's plan for Serana is revealed, we can ask Serana about working against her father. She says that she's been assuming all along that eventually we would have to kill him, and that she's tried to make her peace with it. Yeah. From Castle Volkahar, we set off towards the College of Winterhold to learn more about the last Elder Scroll. Entering the college on this playthrough required casting the Mage Light spell. Although, since I was a vampire now, I didn't have the magic to do it during the day because of the debuff. This was such a catastrophic inconvenience, I decided the only reasonable thing to do would be to retrieve a mythical bow, kill my daughter, and then blot out the sun for the entire realm of existence, likely dooming all the people that I need to eat in order to survive. No, of course I didn't do that, I did the grown-up thing and I took a nap. Retrieving this next scroll for the Dawnguard DLC is the same as retrieving it for the base campaign, and since I covered that in my original Skyrim critique, I'm going to be glossing over it pretty quickly. Blackreach is still spectacular, but traversing it with the speed and power of a vampire lord makes it feel almost pedestrian. I still, after a dozen playthroughs, have no idea how this button puzzle is supposed to work. I just whack random buttons until the ones on the left become accessible. The final scroll retrieved, it's back to Fort Dongard to speak with Dexian. But there is, of course, a bit of a catch. The vampire in the room, as it were. I think perhaps you should speak to Isran. You don't look well. Speak by the divines. You're infected. What are you doing here? You get yourself to Morthal at once. Speak with Falion. He'll help you. But go do it now. Otherwise, you're a threat to all of us. You're not welcome here as long as you're one of those... monsters. You're never offered the chance to defend your transformation, to insist that despite becoming a vampire, you're still committed to this cause, and it was just something you had to do to accomplish your mission. Isran's reaction, or lack thereof, is the most disappointing. To his most effective warrior, the person who investigated Dimala Crypt and retrieved his friends from across Skyrim, he simply says, with no other relevant lines, Get out of here, monster. Get out of here, monster. Get out of here, monster. It's this shallowness that makes me wish we never had a choice before entering the Soul Cairn. Because there's so much drama that can be explored from this tension. Instead, it's just these one-note reactions from people you've been working with for days or possibly weeks. Since Isran was so rude, I made it a point to snack on him before leaving the fort. Reading the Elder Scroll earlier has rendered Dexian blind, but he suggests that the Dragonborn seek out an Ancestor Glade and read the scroll inside, surrounded by Ancestor Moths. Reading the scroll will reveal the location of the bow, so we can get it before Harkon does. But before we move on, there's still some unfinished business to take care of. The quest to cure one's vampirism is one of the more interesting quests in the game. It's extremely simple from a gameplay perspective, just a conversation and handing over a black soul gem, but the dialogue and the atmosphere are wonderfully done. Falion is a mysterious wizard that lives in Morthal, and on the advice of Sorin, we seek him out to find a cure. When you mention that you've heard he's an expert on vampirism, he delivers this line. I know many things. I've studied things beyond the reach of most humans. Traveled the Oblivion Plains, seen things one should not see. I have met Daedra, 
and Dwemer, and everything in between, and I know enough to see a vampire where others would see a man. The writing is well done, the voice acting is strangely I haunting. I think of everything in this DLC, it was Falion's role and this quest that surprised me the most. If you have a Black Soul Gem, you can start the curing process right away, and he says, Very well. Meet me at the summoning circle in the marsh at dawn. We shall banish the creature you have become. Like every other location in Skyrim, the marsh is beautiful and haunting in its own way. In the main quest, players dashed through this biome to get to Ustengrav and perhaps never returned. But here you wade through the shallow waters, a light fog building in the distance. In the dark of the night, the only real color comes from the purple death bell flowers that shoot up from the frigid ground. Parts of it almost remind you of the Soul Cairn. The life in the marshes of Morthal is oddly gnarled, twisted looking. And then, unmarked on the map in the middle of it all, is the mysterious summoning circle. I got there a few hours early, so I had to wait for Falion to arrive. I checked with Serana to see if there were any extra dialogue options, but strangely, she doesn't have anything to say. As well developed as her character is, the fact that there's no conversation that takes place when a vampiric dragonborn is seeking the cure for themselves is such a huge missed opportunity. From a writing perspective, you have two characters who care about each other but have this conflict. The dragonborn has vampiric powers but is going to get rid of them, and Serana, the person who gave them to us, is someone who up to this point has pushed back on the idea of ever curing herself. I get it, it's Skyrim, we weren't going to get an 8 minute dialogue on the nature and responsibility of this kind of dark power, but the fact that it's not even mentioned is frustrating. So Serana and the Dragonborn wait in what I imagine is an awkward silence for the ceremony to begin. I love the old magic feel of the ceremony and how fitting it is for what's happening. I mentioned earlier that so much of this DLC feels like the confrontation of the old and the new, and here in the heart of the marsh we are standing on the old. This cure feels fittingly ancient, it feels mysterious. And then, as quickly as it came, Falion walks away, saying only, The ritual is complete. Uh, okay. This moment is almost a perfect encapsulation of Bethesda's frustrating approach to narrative craft. It's not like they don't know what they're doing, because at times they can deliver creative and captivating moments like this. But it's almost as though they see dialogue and conversations as catalysts for what they consider gameplay, rather than dialogue or conversation being a significant part of the gameplay. And I think it makes the experience significantly more shallow as a result. Having been cured of vampirism, we can continue our efforts to rebuild the Dawn Guard. Nobody back at the fort acknowledges what the player has just gone through. Nobody asks what it was like to have been a vampire lord. This could have been an engaging and thought-provoking arc within the broader story, but there's almost no dialogue ever acknowledging this possibility. There's one other major ally to recruit for the Dawn Guard before we move into our third act, an eccentric priest of Arcae named Florentius. Sorin tells us to ask Isron about him, though she thinks he's going to need some convincing. I went up to Isron's room and aroused him to discuss it. Like the others, Isron made no mention of my having been cured, despite calling me a monster only a day or so ago. Sorin had primed us for Florentius to be something of a sore spot, but when Isron says he doesn't trust him, and you just say, Sorin thought we need his help, Isron capitulates immediately. I suppose she's right. I shouldn't let my personal feelings get in the way. I guess it sort of makes sense since Isron is so single-minded about rebuilding the Dawnguard and stopping the vampires, but then I'm not sure why Sorin makes it sound like this is going to be a tricky and delicate conversation. This could be an indication of Isran's maturing, but then again, a few days ago, his best warrior returned as a vampire after risking his life to retrieve an Elder Scroll, and all he had to say was, Get out of here, monster. Another instance of Bethesda's shallowness undermining the little narrative work that they do attempt. Florentius and his fellow vigilants have been captured by a powerful vampire, and finding Florentius requires sneaking and shooting our way through a dungeon full of his bewitched brethren. With the enhanced Dwarven crossbow and the benefits of a moderately leveled sneak skill, killing the vampire in charge only takes a pair of crossbow bolts, and before long, we're able to set Florentius free. The reason I wanted to take the time to cover this final rescue is because of the information you learn from Sorin and Florentius about the old Dawn Guard. Back towards the start of the Dawn Guard questline, we can ask Isran about the old Dawn Guard, and he'll say, Back in the second era, the Jarl of Riften had a son. Adventurous type. Too much for his own good, it seems. Wound up turning into a vampire. The Jarl, unable to kill his own son, spent a fortune building this keep and hiring men to guard it. Their job was to keep the Jarl's son contained within. 
They took it seriously, and served honorably. They were eventually forced to put him down. The Jarl banished them from the hold, but they stuck to their cause. It's a simple, honorable history of men who put duty over everything. But that's not the only version of the Dongard's history we'll hear. If you ask Soren about it, she says, I've only heard stories. Not sure if any of them are true. Like that they were supposed to guard some vampire here, but wound up all becoming vampires themselves when they saw how powerful he was. And then preyed on the rift until finally someone put them down. I guess it doesn't matter now. At least Isran is trying to do something noble with the name. Florentius, once he settles in, will share a similar story. The story they'd like you to believe is that they were such a noble bunch, doing the honorable thing and saving lives. Only I hear that's not quite how it happened. Secret organization, you see. No one to blame when homes are broken into, things stolen. Heard they'd go on midnight raids, pillaging and looting, and then stash the spoils somewhere, guarded by their sigil. The evidence you can find in the caves seems to confirm Florentius's version of events, which means that the Dongard has a much darker history than Isran believes. It's part of the underexplored theme of this DLC, that people and organizations that have, for one reason or another, been unvirtuous, can still change, can still ultimately be a force for good in the world. It's part of why I was frustrated that there wasn't a conversation with Isran about a vampiric dragonborn in the Dawnguard. It's clear from Serana that these vampiric powers can be put to good use. Isran will reluctantly thank Serana at the end of this, so he kind of ends up coming to that understanding as well. But if the Dawnguard can be redeemed, can be used to keep Skyrim safe from the evil vampires, why can't certain vampires? Why can't Serana or a vampiric dragonborn stay in this organization? What was once corrupted need not always be evil. Again, we're getting a surprising depth from Dawnguard, but there are just frustrating moments when I feel like it's not connecting its own dots. When I started this project, I thought it would be a quick 65 minute video that I could post for Halloween. But once I got into the game and started looking at my notes, I think Dawnguard is actually more thematically complex and ambitious than the vague story about power that we get in the main quest. There are great characters in this DLC, great character moments, by Bethesda standards at least, but I feel like so many of these moments just fade away without a greater thematic resolution, or worse still, they resonate briefly before being contradicted by the story later in the game. So let's talk about the rest of the game, which means taking the three Elder Scrolls to the Ancestor Glade on Skyrim's southern border. The forest east of Falkreath is gorgeous, a slightly more rugged version of the Great Forest near Coral down south. Trapped between the mountains, the fog hangs lazily on the trees, the sun struggling to make it through to the dirt-covered road. On that road, we encountered a skirmish between a local bandit outfit and a Thalmor patrol. I was impressed by the visual of it. The three Thalmor soldiers were hunkering down behind a rock, taking cover and seemingly formulating their next move. Two groups of enemies, one a group of virtuous thugs, tearing this nation apart with a savage brutality, doing irreparable harm to the land that we all love, and the other a group of plucky bandits. We shot the Thalmor first. The Ancestor Glade is towards the top of one of Skyrim's southern mountains. The view is as breathtaking as always, and it's somewhat fitting that this magically potent place is at the top of a mountain. On a mountain like this to the southeast, across the border, is the ruins of Cloud Ruler Temple, where the hero of Kavach once snuck his way into Mankar Cameron's paradise. On a mountain like this to the north is Skyhaven Temple, inside of which is Alduin's Wall, where the Dragonborn will, or has, uncovered the means to defeat Alduin. And most significantly, towering above these smaller peaks is the Throat of the World, on which resides the Leader of the Greybeards and a tear in the fabric of time. When the world design and the narrative structure both hit just right, Skyrim can effortlessly conjure this mythopoetic gravitas that makes the player feel odd, inspired, and insignificant at the same time. And then you get inside the Ancestor Glade, and it's… fine? It is initially quite striking, but for me at least my awe quickly fades because there's a superficiality to it that the rest of Skyrim's views just don't have. The Glade makes you stop because it's different, but it's different because the colors are more vivid, and there's a vibrant yellow and green tint over the screen that makes everything feel a little more intense. And after the casual majesty of the cave's exterior, it's hard to overlook the obvious artifice of the Glade. Reading the scroll requires gathering clusters of moths from around the cave. As they start to follow our character, light builds around their body in a giant sphere. And once we have enough, it's time to read the Elder Scroll at the heart of the glade, in the middle of a giant sunbeam shining down despite the snows outside. 
Reading the scroll reveals the location of Oriel's bow, which means we have what it takes to beat Harkon to it and to foil his plan. After it's read, Serana checks in on the Dragonborn, a nice inversion of their dynamic for the rest of the game where it's been our character checking in on her all the time. Are you okay? Almost thought I lost you there. You went as white as the snow. I never trusted those damn scrolls. Who knows what those things could have done to you? Just look at Dexian. It's another sweet moment between the two of them, and kind of the calm before the storm of our third act. We know what we need to do, get the bow, kill Harkon, and now we know where we need to go to do it. We've locked our conflict for our third act. Treasure hunt, patricide, happily ever after. Dawnguard's second act delivered a surprisingly character-driven conflict, with the focus for much of this act being on Serana rather than questing itself. It was a big swing for the Elder Scrolls, and not one it's really taken before, but I think it pays off, even if there is a lot of potential that went unrealized. Unlike the first act, this is now a warm and genuine bond that would believably motivate a Dawnguard or a vampiric dragonborn. Moving into our third act, there's still some tension around her survival, her status as a vampire, and what's going to happen to the family she loves. It's been an emotional and somewhat thoughtful journey up to this point, but it's all leading to a fast-paced, action-packed finale that still has a twist up its sleeve. So how about, how about we get this third act started? No, f that's terrible, that doesn't work. Like Oblivion and Skyrim before it, Dawnguard doesn't mess around with its third act pacing. From the dramatic reading of the scrolls, we're quickly off to a climactic dungeon experience. Darkfall Cave continues the Dawnguard tradition of heavy-handed light imagery, from Dayspring Canyon in the Rift to Dim Hollow Crypt where we found Serana, and now we enter this cave in a bid to defeat Harkon's dark schemes. The first leg of this dungeon leaves its mark by delivering a clunky, uncharted-ish falling sequence, and like the games that inspired it, you can sense the looming disaster before it occurs. It's a fun change of pace, especially since so many of Skyrim's other dungeons are purely static experiences, and being flung down a pair of rivers, powerless to stop your movement, is a refreshing and propulsive experience. It's the start of our road of trials to get the bow, a road that will become significantly more formalized when we discover the secret at the heart of the cave, one of the last remaining snow elves. I am Knight Paladin Gelibor. Welcome to the Great Chantry of Oriel. Oriel, Oriel, Halkosh, Akatosh, so many different names for the sovereign of the snow elves. I prefer snow elf. The name Falmer usually holds a negative meaning to most travelers. Those twisted creatures you call Falmer, I call the Betrayed. He says he knows we're here for Oriel's bow, but before he'll lend his assistance, he wants us to do something for him. I need you to kill Archcurate Vertha, my brother. The kinship between us is gone. I don't understand what he's become, but he's no longer the brother I once knew. It was the Betrayed. They did something to him. I just don't know why Oriel would allow this to happen. We apparently need his help to get the bow, so we accept, and he explains that the way to get to his brother is to follow in the Initiate's footsteps and travel from Wayshrine to Wayshrine. It's a strange time in the game to be introducing two new characters, and I don't think Dongard gives us enough time with either of the brothers to make this feel as weighty as it should for something that takes up most of our third act. But like we've noted with Eastron and Harkon earlier, this is another family that was torn apart by obsession. It works on a structural level, but I think we're just introduced to these characters too late in the story. We can ask Gelibor more about the Falmer, and we find out what led to their wretched condition. Losing the fight with the Nords forced them to turn to desperate measures to survive. We had always maintained an uneasy alliance with the underground dwelling dwarves, and when faced with extinction, we turned to them for help. Surprisingly, they agreed to protect us, but demanded a terrible price. The blinding of our race. There were splinter groups that resisted the agreement, and even some that sought alternate alliances. But when it was all said and done, those elves were either slaughtered, vanished, or gave up and took the dwarves' bargain. I wonder if we're supposed to connect this with Harkon's quest, and the desperate measures to which he is now turning. Harkon is willing to sacrifice his only daughter, and the Snow Elves were willing to sacrifice their sight. But if that's what Dongard is doing, and I don't necessarily think that it is, then we'd be back to the issue of the threat not being grand enough. I believe that the Snow Elves were on the brink of extinction, so this horrible bargain might be understandable for some. I don't believe that the Sun is actually that much of a tyrant over the vampires because we've seen them, Serana being one but the Dragonborn being another, operate fairly easily during the day. 
However legitimate you find the desperation of the vampires, this detail about the Valmer connects that desperation to Dongard's other recurring idea, the old, constantly encroaching on the new, Skyrim's inability to escape its past no matter how hard it tries. And this, too, appears to be part of Skyrim's past, these interspecies conflicts that devastated the losing side. The Nords and the Dwemer didn't really care about the Snow Elves in the same way that the vampires don't really care about the non-vampires. And now, armed with a new and tragic understanding of the Falmer, we have to fight our way through dozens of them to pass through Darkfall Passage and complete the ceremony. After fighting through to the next shrine, the portal takes Serana and the Dragonborn through to the Forgotten Veil. The Forgotten Veil is beautiful in its own way, but its most striking feature is the massive frozen lake in the heart of the valley. I kept running around it waiting for the surprising and cinematic fight between two dragons that burst forth from the ice. But it never happened, I think because like I mentioned earlier, I never started the main quest line. my character's not the dragonborn yet, so sorry. If there were two dragons that exploded out of the ice to attack me, I'd talk about how they're guardians of the valley and it helps make this place feel ancient and mysterious and powerful. The only other place we've seen two dragons in the wild is the entrance to Sovngarde towards the end of the base game's main quest, and that's also obviously a significant location. So this would be, and probably should be, a dramatic moment of gameplay that adds to the narrative weight of this location. Turns out if you just ignore the dragons in Skyrim, they'll ignore you in the Forgotten Vale. Or perhaps living so long in a place called the Forgotten Vale got to them, and they simply forgot about me. The final stretch is a gauntlet of Falmer, a vertical fight in a jagged, narrow canyon, and then at long last we arrive at the Chantry. Like Fort Dongard, like Castle Volkahar, this massive stone structure is tucked away on Skyrim's borders, content to be forgotten by the land around it. I think it's more aesthetically pleasing than both of those locations. The Snow Elf architecture is significantly more ornate and sophisticated than what we experience in the rest of Skyrim. Inside the Chantry is a strange scene, Falmer and Charis frozen around the idols in the center of the room. Some will explode from the ice to attack, just like the dragons down in the lake. Like so much of Skyrim, the visuals are more interesting than the gameplay, and before long, we arrive at what looks like a corrupted throne room. A line of frozen bodies all funnel inwards towards a dark stone throne, which from a distance almost looks the same color as the jagged spikes of ice that dominate the room. When you get close enough to the white figure on the throne, Gelimor's brother, Verther, says ever so villainously, Did you really come here expecting to claim Ariel's bow? You've done exactly as I predicted and brought your fetching companion to me. Not exactly what we were expecting, but we won't have to wait long to find answers. After an awkward battle, which is especially strange for ranged characters, he brings the ceiling down on the Dragonborn and Serana. I don't even know why he does this. Both Serana and Verther are vampires, so it's not like he'd have an advantage outside even if it was light out. It does make for a more dramatic final battle though, and in the spirit of that drama, I may have waited a bit by his throne for more cinematic lighting. So now, with the dawn slowly creeping up behind the mountains, Serana and Verther have a dramatic confrontation, and I really like that this is mostly just Serana's moment. Gelibor and his kind are easily manipulated fools. Look into my eyes, Serana. You tell me what I am. You... you're a vampire? But Ariel should have protected you. The moment I was infected by one of my own initiates, Ariel turned his back on me. I swore I'd have my revenge, no matter what the cost. All I needed was the blood of a vampire and his own weapon, Ariel's bow. The blood of a vampire, Ariel's bow. It was you? You created that prophecy? A prophecy that lacked a single final ingredient. The blood of a pure vampire. The blood of a daughter of Cold Harbor. Again, I like that Serana trusts in herself and her power to deal with this largely on her own. It's a good conclusion for her arc. She's gone from being hidden in a dungeon for centuries to openly challenging the mastermind behind this entire prophecy. So I like this moment for that, but this twist about him being a vampire and Oriel failing to protect him feels somewhat half-baked. It might be because I'm missing something, but if that's the case, I think that's probably part of the problem. If someone playing through your quest, taking like 
eight pages of notes, doesn't understand a part of your lord that's this important and influential, it's probably an issue with the game, not the player. He's mad at Oriel or Akatosh for not protecting him, and wants to strike a blow against him for that reason. But we've seen time and time again how the gods can't protect people from vampires. Back in Act 1, we literally walked through the ruined Hall of the Vigilance of Stendar, the god of righteous might. She's not a god, but in Oblivion, there was a whole quest from Azura about killing her followers who were turned into vampires. Death being a mercy, their release. So it's a little confusing because my first instinct is to just think that I missed something and kind of move on. But if Dongard is doing this on purpose, then I think it could have been a fascinating moment if we got to tell him that. The gods don't have that much power anymore, and that's partly why believing in them is an act of faith rather than subservience. Or even point out that maybe Oriel was testing him, because becoming a vampire doesn't mean that you have to be evil, or that you have to abandon everything you once were. Just look at Serana, the woman standing right in front of him. He could have used the power and immortality as a gift to protect the remaining snow elves. Instead, he concocts a prophecy to lure Serana here and lash out against the gods. It's a good conclusion for Serana's arc, but the moment just doesn't land with the weight that I think it could have. The actual fight is over in seconds, as Serana handles him fairly easily. With his brother dead, Galibor emerges. A vampire. I see. Uh, that would explain much. Deep inside, it brings me joy that the betrayed weren't to blame for what happened here. Because that means there's still hope that they might one day shed their hatred and learn to believe in Oriel once again. Back in Act 2, when I was going through the Dwemer ruins to get the crossbow schematics, I made a note about how many of the Falmer camps seemed to be set up around fountains. Again, I don't know if this was on purpose, but it would make sense that the Falmer may find some comfort in the sound of the waters, especially since their ancestors had a spiritual ritual surrounding these water basins. Galibor says he still has some hope for the Falmer. This little detail about the water and the fountains may be enough of a reason to believe that they're still worthy of that hope. And now, after a continent-spanning scavenger hunt, we finally claim Oriel's bow. And with the bow in our possession, there's only one thing left to do. Confront Harkon. This has to end here and now. Serana suggests we go to Isron for help attacking Castle Volkahar. Isron is supportive and delivers a typically middling Elder Scrolls battle speech. To paraphrase Henry V, the fewer men, the greater chance you'll actually land any of your fucking crossbow bolts. The battle inside Castle Volkahar is cramped and awkward, and getting to Harkon Shrine to Molag Ball can be accomplished fairly quickly. If you've spent more time with these characters on other playthroughs, I'm sure it's harder to fight through them. But for a Dongar Dragonborn, these are characters we only ever saw for a brief moment. Even Serana kills them without compunction. All that's left is the inevitable confrontation with Harkon. You know why we're here. Of course I do. You disappoint me, Serana. You've taken everything I provided for you and thrown it all away for this pathetic being. You've gone soft, my sweet set of pie. No, my sweet set of pie, I've gone hard. Because he's my best friend, he's my pal. He's my homeboy, my rotten soldier. He's my sweet cheese, my good time boy. Provided for me? Are you insane? You've destroyed our family. You've killed other vampires all over some prophecy that we barely understand. No more. I'm done with you. You will not touch him. We saw Serana's fearlessness back in the Forgotten Vale, and now, after centuries, she does what even her mother couldn't do. She stands up to Harkon. It's a much more interesting dynamic than the Harkon Dragonborn confrontation, which, much like the Verther moment, could have been engaging, but it's just so underdeveloped. Neither Serana nor the Dragonborn tell him that he was manipulated by a snow elf, and that for all his pride he was outmaneuvered by someone half a world away. Then, when Harkon says that his daughter's sacrifice would be a small price to pay for the betterment of our kind, the only response is to say, your kind is a blight on this world. And I was shocked. I stared at this line for like 10 seconds because I just couldn't believe that that was the only response. Even setting aside the fact that the Dragonborn was a vampire at one point and used those powers for good, Serana is right there. And depending on your playthrough, she's either one of your best friends at this point or there's more of a romantic tension between you two. And you label her entire people a blight. 
with the same kind of blind judgment that Isran displays. It's so poorly done, and it undermines so much of the work this game has done to make this relationship feel real. Not only does it undermine the Dragonborn's bond with Serana, but it undermines one of the core messages of the main quest. That a blind obsession just pushes the people you love away. Your kind is a blight on this world. If Skyrim cared about its characters, saying this right in front of Serana should do irreparable harm to that relationship. She might have felt manipulated or betrayed, but instead we just move right on to a sloppy boss fight. Harkon's demise means that Skyrim's son is safe. Probably, unless for whatever reason you decide to blot it out yourself with Oriel's bow, which, since you're never given any indication that it's temporary, is nuts and makes you just as villainous and short-sighted as Harkon was. But before we move on to the battle's aftermath, I wanted to expand on the mythic significance of that. In my Skyrim critique, I talked about how Skyrim's main quest was their twist on Ragnarok, with Alduin the World Eater taking the place of the Serpent Nidiga. It's interesting that Dongard's quest is about preventing the destruction of the sun, which is also part of Ragnarok. It's a quote from the poem Volusbo, Black become the sun's beams in the summers that follow, weathers all treacherous. In Norse mythology, it's obviously not an arrogant vampire going after an ancient bow to destroy the sun. I think it's a wolf chasing the sun that finally catches it. But it's interesting if we consider Dongard's story as something that occurs after the main quest of Skyrim. If we treat the release schedule as canon, and I think that's as good a way as any to do it, though I'm open to suggestions, then Dongard canonically occurs after stopping Alduin the World Eater. We've halted the most obvious part of the Ragnarok event, and yet here's another part, the blackening of the sun. They're even connected through the prophecy we heard. In an age of strife, when dragons return to the realm of men, darkness will mingle with light, and the night and the day will be as one. So these two events, the return of Alduin and this threat to the sun, are prophetically linked in this universe, just like in Norse mythology. So are these two different apocalyptic events that just so happen to be linked via prophecy, or are these two manifestations of a singular, inevitable apocalypse, in which case we should be vigilant about a third? Are we experiencing what the Greybeards were talking about when they said that the world is meant to end? Skyrim doesn't answer any of this. I'm not even sure how aware it is that it's posing this kind of question. There is so much groundwork that was, perhaps unknowingly, laid for a fascinating piece of major story content, one that confronts Skyrim's seemingly inevitable doom. Is this really the will of the gods? Have they perhaps abandoned the land like Verther seems to think? Or are the Dragonborn's victories a testament to their grace? I don't think the final DLC, Dragonborn, answers any of that. It's been a while since I played it, so I'm open to being pleasantly surprised when I cover it in the future. It does, I think, give face to this conflict of the old Skyrim and the new Skyrim, but it does so outside of Skyrim, which for me cheapens the narrative experience somewhat, but more on that in another video, hopefully. Now's also our last chance to observe Bethesda's nominative playfulness. Harkon's name is obviously similar to the word Harkon, which means listen. If Harkon literally hearkened anyone close to him like Serana or Valerica, he might have been convinced that his obsession was going to lead to his death, and he could have perhaps just lived a long, bloody life with a wife and a daughter who loved him. Instead, he's, well, you know, this. There's also a phonetic connection to the Jonathan Harker character in Dracula, Harker Harkon. After the fight, Isran enters the room if you were on the Dongard path, and Garen if you were on the Vampire path. Isran so, says, I, I suppose this is difficult for you. I think my father really died a long time ago. This was just the end of something else. I did what needed to be done. Nothing more. I think perhaps. I think you did more than that. You have my thanks. Which, from Isran, is saying a lot. He's thanking Serana, acknowledging her sacrifice. It has all the pieces necessary for the end of an arc. But I just wish we went that one half-step further, where he either directly invites her back to Castle Dongard, or does it more casually, where he lets her know that she'll have a bed there if she ever needs one. We're feet away from Harkon's smoldering, sticky remains. We can literally see the perils of obsession. And yet in this moment, Isran is able to overcome his hatred enough to pay Serana his respects, but he's not able to let go of it to the point of actually welcoming her in some way. The only reason the day was won was because the Dragonborn worked with a vampire, or, depending on your choice, became one. And so I just want a tiny bit more from Isran here. After this exchange, he just casually walks out, back to Fort Dongard. The conversation with Serana is a bit more satisfying. Well, now that's done. 
I'm not sure. I'll probably stay with the Dawn Guard for as long as they'll let me. They're respectable fighters, and I think they see the benefits of having a vampire on their side now. Of course, if you've got any more adventures planned, that's what I wanted to hear. It's the kind of exchange you might hear before she, like, climbs into the car and the two of you tear down the street towards your next adventure, the camera gradually pulling back as a thematically resonant pop song plays. But I don't mind, it fits with the pulpy atmosphere of this expansion. It's a nice place to leave Serana's character, too. Having faced her demons, she's ready to finally make a life for herself. Before the adventures begin, there's a pair of loose ends to tie up. The first being Serana's mother still being in the Soul Cairn. With Harkon finally dead, she can return to this realm, free of fear. Retrieving her is going to require another dive into the Soul Cairn, and by now, some of you may have identified a hitch in my plan. Having been cured of vampirism, I can't enter the Soul Cairn. And now, the time I'd actually want to use the weightless partial soul trap option, it's no longer available. So in order to go get Valerica, the only way we can restore Serana the family she wants and deserves, we have to become a vampire again. The things we do for love. What? Are you certain? Then I see nothing preventing my return to Tamriel. Allow me to gather some of my things, and I'll head back to Castle Volkahar. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. I thought Serana might have a line of dialogue about this, but all she said was, I was hoping it wouldn't smell this bad. Uh, okay then. Even back in her alchemy lab, the two don't interact. And if you talk with Valerica, she just talks about how she's pleased to be able to get back to her research and that she's planning on restoring the castle. She doesn't mention Serana once, which is somewhat fitting for her more selfish character, but it's just strange that even Serana doesn't mention the two of you doing this. Her mother may have chosen her exile, but it was still an exile. Serana should be able to relate to her. They're both experiencing true freedom for the first time in centuries, and Dongar just ignores it. What comes before anything? What have we always said is the most important thing? Breakfast. Family. Family, right. Yeah. <laughs> The other loose thread is Serana herself, and whether she's willing to be cured of her vampirism. You can talk her into it, though it's one of the rare times in Skyrim where you can fail a dialogue encounter. I think it's still somewhat bugged though, as Serana was acting like I had failed this dialogue before when the only other time we talked about it was back at the start of Act 2, when it's not even an option. So like any scrappy hero, I bent the rules a bit and just used console commands to send her off to get cured. Shh, it's fine. She leaves your party and says, I'll see you when I'm done. For now, I just need to do this. But we, of course, know where she's going, the marshes of Morthal. I was curious to see if we could overhear the ceremony, so like an awful friend, I ignored her wishes and I snuck after her. I ran into her on the outskirts of town, clearly still a vampire, and she just repeats the same line. I'll see you when I'm done. For now, I just need to do this. So I went to the summoning circle and waited hour by hour, expecting Serana to show up at one point. When it got closer to dawn, I tried sneaking up on the rocks just so Serana wouldn't see me. But she never showed up. Falion does, as part of his nightly routine. But no Serana. She shows up back in Fort Dongard a few days later. There you are. I'm... I'm back. Here I am. Human as ever. It's like the world is alive again. Just like me. And that's that. If you ask her to come with you, she says, I know you'd miss me. It's nice, there's an obvious intimacy there, but like so much of this third act, it feels underdeveloped. Serana made a huge decision, gave up her immortality, and all we get from her is, I'm back. What? When I talk about how Skyrim is often disinterested in its characters, this is why. There is so much narrative potential in this conversation, and we don't explore any of it. Why couldn't Serana's transformation and the fallout from that choice get the same attention as Agmir's emotions around joining the Dawn Guard? I know more about this guy's weapon than I do about Serana's new life as a mortal. It's not even a question of pacing, as both these moments, rescuing Valerica and curing Serana, happen after the main story has concluded. So despite all of Dongard's time and attention to building these characters, and specifically this relationship, it mishandles the two moments that should matter the most. And it's a shame that that's the note on which we leave this DLC.
Dongard is such an interesting piece of story content to examine because it feels like it's being pulled in two different directions. Without having to be a capital M main quest like the base game Stopping of Alduin, it feels like it's confident enough to start a little more slowly to try to set up a story based around character conflicts rather than the more classic good and evil. It doesn't do this flawlessly. I think we can go so far as to say that it doesn't even do it well. But it feels different to play. It feels more grounded and emotional. You can see the pieces that could have come together in a different way to tell a thoughtful, personal story about love and obsession. But they don't really come together because of Skyrim's incessant pulling of Dongard into the prophetic, apocalyptic slops of its lackluster main story. Interesting emotional relationships are undermined by the element of prophecy. We're dragged back into the same kind of story this series has told time and time again. Despite the clear opportunity, there's no observation of Skyrim's perseverant doom. The prophecy's double meaning means that stopping Harkon costs us nothing. In the end, instead of a memorable story, I think we're just left with a memorable character, a few well-executed moments, and, most importantly, another excuse to run around this magnificent land for a few hours. And, at the end of the day, that's not so bad. Good to see another merry soul enjoying this fine day. Now that the Dawn Guard are back, the vampire's reign of terror is about to end. Sounds like a regular wacko, a real son of a bitch. Yes. I'll keep my peepers peeled for that guy.